Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining me today. Thank you, Tom, for the introduction. It's super odd to be using this microphone. I am really feeling challenged, so bear with me. If it starts dropping and you cannot hear me, somebody please raise your hand. Don't be overly polite. I will appreciate your feedback. So, actionable incident response documentation. I hope that many of you got a chance to join the keynote that we had on the first date by Power. I was listening to that presentation with the perspective of an incident responder. And there were two numbers which stood out in this talk for me. The first number is the number on the left. 64% of organizations do not have a cybersecurity incident response plan. I can confirm based on my experience that this is also my observation. Probably, I checked the source of these uh, numbers. The reports are 2022, 2023. So the number has improved a bit. Maybe we are getting closer to 55, but still that is a pretty scary number. The second number we see on the right-hand side, 77% of organizations that do have a plan, well, they don't end up testing it. So if you do the math out of the, let's say, 50-55, if 77 don't even test it, how many of the organizations actually have an actionable incident response plan? The question I would like to delve into today is why does this happen? And in my opinion, it goes back to one, one thing that we are all guilty of. We, technical people, simply love writing technical documentation. I think many of you will relate to this warm, nice feeling of waking up in the morning, opening your travel board, and there it is, the last task which has been left before your security feature gets released, it's to write the technical documentation. You cannot wait to start your day. Similar feelings fill up my heart when I see an ISO 27001 risk assessment. You know the pretty colorful Excel tables with approximately 175 lines, and you need to fill for each requirement what are the security controls required. Such a great exercise. You simply look forward to it the whole day. We get even more of this now because this is Article 21 of the NIS 2 regulation, the directive, that is um, becoming effective in the fall, requires compliance from January, 17th of January. And for example, one of the requirements is to have incident handling. So I know a manager, a SOC manager, who got asked by his CISO to create a description of the incident handling procedure in their organization in preparation for NIST 2. Well, they aren't exactly national laws at the moment so that you know what exactly you need to prepare, but that's even better. You have full creative freedom. Isn't that so great? Well, it is great, and I'm sure that if I were now to ask to, to get a count of hands who loves writing technical documentation, I would not be able to count the people in this room. But I have heard that there are actually people out there who do not like writing technical documentation of any sort. There are very few. I personally know none, and I cannot relate to their feelings. But I have heard that they go actually in great length to avoid writing any type of technical documents. Like, for example, they would do it only in, if it's put in their official performance review requirements. Others would, oops, that was not planned. Others would um, use the help of AI. I must mention AI in every talk. It was a formal requirement. <laughs> So they'll get um, pretty much an AI-generated incident response plan. And a third group, and that is borderline uh, criminal, they would even create a summer intern position, and they'll have the intern write the incident response plan. 
wow, what a world do we live in? Well, we are an open community, so we want to have this conference, different talks for different types of audience, and that's why this presentation would be intended as help for anyone, for those few selected people in the audience who don't really see the bliss of writing technical documentation, but still have to do it. And I will approach the topic from my perspective. So my name is Gergana Karajova Dangelo, Senior Incident Response with the Taos team based uh, off of Switzerland and Liechtenstein. And what I do in my role is twofold. And that is important, pay attention, because it explains the background of the information that I'll be presenting. The first part of my work is what most of you imagine when you think of incident response. I do technical analysis during active incidents. I analyze logs, triage collections, look at network traffic, all the pretty things that we wish every organization to have. The second part of my job is to actually work with organizations on creating documentation, conducting exercises, go, going through assessments, which prepare them better for a potential incident. It's cool to have these two perspectives, the emergency one pretty much being when I see when what happens if you don't have a plan in place, and the other one. The other one, however, allows me not to judge organizations, but rather to see that writing the instant response plan happens in the context of ongoing network segmentation, SIM implementation, MFA introduction, and you name it, the list is long. So those guys actually have a lot on their plate. Well, we're not here to mourn. We are here to discuss actionable incident response documentation, and that's what I'm going to do. This presentation will be structured in a very, very clear way, pure sugar, eight tips for writing actionable incident response documentation, followed by a Q&A. Let's get started. Tip number one. The tip number one is based on the idea that we need good incident response documentation, not to fulfill an audit requirement, but actually to have better security. So everything starts with document hierarchy. Define a document hierarchy at the beginning of writing any incident response documentation. What is a document hierarchy? Sounds very bizarre, and we at IT definitely don't like hierarchies. So, it's actually a bit like structuring a substantial amount of code. You don't want to have a mishmash of like global definitions in the main function, etc. You want to have a structure to follow. And it's exactly the same with instant response documentation. You start with something which is applicable to everyone. This is the information security policy. This is the document that is intended for every employee in the organization from the technical teams to the person at the front desk. And then you go into something which is more specific. For, so, in this case, when we talk about incident response, we focus on the incident response plan. This is the document which defines what is the overall structure and process you follow when you have an incident. Who will be involved and what steps will be taken. This document is similar as a um, hierarchy level as the disaster recovery plan, for example, and the business continuity plan. Good. We've defined what is our overall process. We, knew, we use, for example, the NIST uh, IR process, uh, five stages. Well, now we need something a bit more specific, and that's where we come to the playbooks. The playbook is the next level of document hierarchy, and they're usually scenario-specific. You would have a ransomware, business email compromise, and a bunch of other ones nowadays. Good, but we have been talking so much about automation in this uh, past few days. Now we need something for our tools, actually. And this is what we refer to as runbooks. Runbooks are steps, response steps, which would be executed by security software. So, the blue ones, incident response plan and playbooks, it's for a human mind, for an analyst to read and understand. Sometimes you can have them in a wiki confluence. 
the very low level it is uh, for a machine uh, to interpret and the information security policy, they should be kept really at a level that everyone can understand that. So the further down we go, the more specific it gets, the higher we go, the broader our audience. So I'm Bulgarian, we trust but we verify, so let's do a quick exercise. I will show you a few examples of uh, information and I'll ask you to tell me in which document this information should ideally be placed. Starting with the description of post-incident actions. Post-incident actions, this is something that you do at the end of an incident. I would expect at a well-organized organization to have lessons learned session, where you discuss what went well, what could be done better, to have formal reporting, to have optimization of your uh, infrastructure and some documentation improval. Is that information going to be in the instant response plan or in the playbooks? And here I'm going to reach out to the people in the first line, the brave ones, and ask for an opinion. <laughs> So, what is your opinion? In which document would this information be? Um, I think in the incident response plan. Incident response plan? Absolutely correct. <laughs> so, in the incident response plan, why? Well, think about it. You want to have a post-incident action plan for all types of incidents, not just for ransomware, not just for business email compromise. You actually want this to be a standard procedure. Does it make sense to repeat it in each and every playbook? In my opinion, no. Keep the information as um, limited as possible, and if it's applicable to multiple types of documents, then it needs to be simply on the higher level. So this is the information we have in the plan. Second example, the first line is safe, don't need to run away. How about if you have a description of the steps to follow when you're investigating a suspicious DOL? So you would probably get a hash, you would probably use a sandbox. Where would we place this information? In the incident response plan or in the playbooks? Anyone from the second line? Playbooks. Playbooks, exactly. I would expect to see this in malicious code playbook or in a ransomware one. Good, tip number two, the must have information. I often get asked how long is an incident response plan. I have seen anything from 11 pages to 72. So it really depends why you're writing the plan, we'll get to this a bit later, and who is going to use it. There are however a few things which you really must have in your plan. And I'll summarize them with these four points. You need to explain the who will do what, when, and how. So, the who. Who are the people who are going to be involved in the incident response process? What actions are they going to perform? You can, for example, organize them based on the structure of your general incident response process. You know how you have detection and analysis, containment, eradication? Well, it would make a lot of sense for the reader if you split their actions per phase, for example. When, and here with the when, I really, really mean the escalation process and the escalation paths. This is very tricky during an incident. You better have this defined clearly before an incident. For example, is the SOC 2 analyst that discovers a high priority incident on a Friday afternoon going to escalate this and wake up his manager on, in the night, uh, to sat in Saturday night after they are 10 machines infected, 1,000 or more, and what if the 10 machines, one of them is the one having the blueprints of your new machine that will be launched in the fall. All of those considerations should be there so that it's crystal clear when and how it should be escalated. And the tooling, I know what most of you are thinking, you're thinking about security tools, but it's not only that actually. Because in an incident response situation, there are a lot other tools other than the purely security ones. For example, your mail server is, done, uh, is down. You're not sure whether the normal um, web messaging client that you use is secure. Maybe the adversary is actually listening to your communication. Do you have alternative infrastructure that you can spin up 
quickly and choose? It's a good question. And during an incident, you should not be answering this question. When we talk about these four points, it is good to think where in our uh, incident response documentation journey are we? And there is often a bit of a difference between the current state and the target state. I'm not sure this translates that nicely in uh, English and uh, target state, I mean um, the Zollzustand, the, the desired um, state for the future. So what I usually observe is the following. Current state. Two SOC analysts. The SOC was put together kind of in the last year. And there are a lot of processes which are being formed. Currently, no coverage outside of normal working hours. Where these guys are aiming to get, hold your breath, it is here. They're realistic. They know they would not be able to cover 24-7 internally. That's smart, actually. So they want to build an internal SOC to cover the normal working hours and hire an external managed SOC to help them with the uh, outside of normal working hours. What happens, actually, is that in between there is a current state which continues for quite some time where they're looking for a SOC provider. They need to get this through, through procurement. They need to establish processes to onboard the people. The current state takes long. And my question usually is, so are we writing the plan for the desired state, for the target state, for the current state, or for what is uh, perceived to be actually undesired um, state of the past, but very often people are stuck in the blue line for a long time. N none of those is wrong. Pretty much be clear what you want to reflect in this plan. Tip number two, other teams. So we are very social as technical people, cybersecurity professionals. We like working with others. And we want to invite them to the fun of creating technical documentation. So. When we write an incident response plan, we need to think about all of our buddies that we're going to involve during an incident. Normally, we start with the technical teams. These are the ones closer to our heart. So we will think about the networking guys, the server, the application, uh, backup team, super, super important team, identity and management. The other teams, the ones which are a bit on the right-hand side, we tend to forget. So these are the non-technical colleagues, legal, communication, somebody needs to write a public statement, better not be you. The help desk, help desk, depending how you, how you qualify it, is it technical or non-technical, they're super important because they will be the one escalating the incident and making sure that the security team gets involved quickly. And the HR team, so what if com um, data of employees is affected? You need to have your HR ready to support you with the proper practices. At the bottom, I know the people at the very back don't really see that, uh, we have the crisis management team, disaster recovery, and business continuity. Those are ad hoc teams which are built in the case of a major cybersecurity incident which is actually not just related to IT, to cybersecurity, but is um, really a crisis. So think about the processes for these teams and how are the two, the instant response and the ones on the, at the bottom going to cooperate. I know quite a lot to think about. Which brings me to the next tip, static versus dynamic content. Let me clarify the two terms because they're anything but obvious. Static content. I, I mentioned 72 pages. In some, uh, some part of the 72 pages, luckily, will be things that would not be changing very often. Examples. Once you describe your incident response process as phases, you're most likely going to stick with it for some years. You're not going to change from NIST to SANS every two years. It doesn't make sense. Also, the so-called document control parts, like what is your audience, what is your scope, how you maintain the document, you write it once, you use it for quite some time. Or the team structure and roles. I hope for the 
benefit of physical and mental benefit of all of you, you don't go through restructuring every year. So the structure of the team would uh, stay um, approximately the same for some time. So this is static content. Then we have dynamic content, which is everything which refers to some type of a dynamic process. Most important are the escalation processes. Then, uh, for example, when does exactly a team gets activated? When do you build an instant response team and it's no longer just two analysts working on the case, but you bring in all of those teams that I showed on the previous slide? Communication during an uh, incident. And is it um, that you release the statement when you send the notification to the legal authorities or you actually inform your users earlier? Um, what statements do you make when? I have a simple rule to recommend here. Spend 40% of your effort developing the plan, working on static content and 60% on dynamic. Because the dynamic content, so the moving parts is usually where you have misunderstandings and problems later on. Make sure this part is really well written and very clear so that the reader will end up using it. To do that, we want to put together a dream team. In this dream team, we do not have the intern but we do have quite a few other people. In my experience, this is the setup that usually works best and the fastest. Um, you start with the people who are senior technical staff to write the bulk of your instant response documentation with some support of middle technical management. The senior technical staff, they know the operations, they know how things should be done and how are done, and depending on which state you want to describe, they'll be the one to create the first solid draft. Then bring in the whole team, get a team review, and don't leave out the new people because actually they have some of the, the best uh, perspective, fresh eyes on it. Then we need to bring in our management. So the senior technical management would be the one that would verify that the plan doesn't contradict in any way what is described in the policy, in the other documents which are on the same hierarchy level. And finally, the CISO. If this role is established in your organization, this would be the person who would be the final, um, carry the final accountability for the instant response process. They must have read and agreed to sign this document because in some countries like the UK, they actually would suffer legal consequences if the incident handling process would fail. Tip number four is something which I have seen in, uh, based on my experience. I, I go running. I'm not a marathon runner, but I have learned that, um, the, I need to be very strategic about what race I sign up for, what distance, and this really determines the preparation time. The shorter the race, the shorter the preparation. So when you're working on instant response documentation, general advice expected to take long, longer than what you have planned. And it depends where you start. So if you're a top fit athlete, your preparation would be faster. Let's say if you have done everything and you just need to write a new sim rule, that's a hundred meter sprint. You can do that quite quickly. Two weeks and probably you are ready. It looks a bit different if you don't really have a playbook. I would compare this to a 5K run. You need to put some time building up the stamina. Even more if there is no plan because the plan is going to take you good three months to develop if you're starting from scratch. We have, of course, the situation where you need to set up a whole new SOC and create a whole new IR process. And for those people who come from organizations where actually there isn't a security practice, the only thing that I can compare it with is a Kona triathlon. It is a famous um, triathlon in Hawaii. It takes time to prepare for such a thing. But we are here to actually be optimistic and look in the bright future where the plan is ready. And now it's time to do what I think is one of the, the most fun parts of it. 
test the IR documentation that is there. So that's my tip number seven. And we're going to do a bit of a practical exercise and we have time for this. Be prepared, this will be the most text heavy slide that I have in the whole deck, but I'll guide you through it, you'll survive it, so take a deep breath. You see at the top of the statement, uh, of the slide, a statement. It is a typical step, it's a real step from the ransomware playbook that we would develop. It is in the recovery stage, so towards the end of an incident. Um, or it can also be in a very early containment in the first phase. You can put it in both places, duplicate it. The step says, the incident lead, the incident manager, contacts the backup management team to get the status of the backups. This step is important just as a context because very often what we would see in a ransomware context is that um, before triggering, before starting the encryption, ransomware groups would corrupt the backups so that the organization has no easy way to go back to their good copies of the data and they feel put under pressure to pay the ransomware. So for an organization, it is really critical to know the status of the backups because this is one of the first questions management is going to ask. It is, it sounds quite easy, I think you all agree, but if we take a bit of a look at it, and if we were to actually talk with the backup management team, here are some thoughts, what additional questions they would ask. Question number one. So, that is the commander, how does the incident commander actually contact the backup management team? What if um, the main communication channels of the organization are not available online and the main tools are down? The IR team most likely will have a backup communication channel, whether it's Sigma, Mattermost, or something else. Is the backup uh, team going to be reachable in that way? Does, does somebody have the, the phone contacts of the backup management team? Good thing to check. Another good question, is the backup uh, management team going to be available at this time of the day? Many teams do not have weekend duty and incidents, at least ransomware, they do start on a Friday afternoon as a general rule. So you want to have somebody available um, outside of normal business hours. Then, good, okay, we get the, to, we can contact the backup team. Next question. How are you going to find out the latest date of the backups? And how is somebody who is, let's say, new, who is not the most experienced guy in the backup team, going to verify that actually the backups haven't been tampered with? That could be a very easy task for somebody who has been with the company for 10 years, but if it's a new person, they would benefit from a procedure to do that. One more question. What if we have already isolated the backups? Some organizations do have this as a very early containment uh, step. As soon as there is the suspicion that there is ransomware, isolate the backups, take them offline, which we generally recommend. You just need to be sure that you have ways to actually con connect to the management console and check the integrity of those backups, even if you were to isolate them. And one final question. Well, the instant commander is getting a lot of information. How is the instant commander actually going to keep track of all of this inter information and be able to share it with the larger team that he's actually leading? One simple statement at the top, five, and I bet we can come up with another five additional questions. You would be very quick to find these questions, to find them out, to come up with them, if you bring in the backup team in some type of an exercise. Um, I hope that some of you could join. There was a talk yesterday by Simva uh, Hirsch. He talked a lot about Purple Team. That that was actually um, really encouraging for me to hear because I think Purple Team is something that we'll see more coming up and I hope that um, next year at the conference we'll have more talks that mention it. Purple Team is one example of an exercise that could test IR documentation. There are three parameters when you think about tests. You can mix and match to come up with the right match for you at this specific uh, moment. Audience. Is the exercise going to be for the technical folks 
or you plan on bringing some of the management people. You need to know who would be the audience because um, CISOs usually don't uh, sit just like this for three hours in an exercise without saying a word. If they are in the room, you need to have questions for them and get them involved. Um, second point, scenario. You can, so the most often scenario that I see uh, being tested in tabletops, in, in exercises, this is ransomware. But we see increasingly more uh, insider threat in business email compromise scenarios. How do you decide which scenario to test? Well, do threat modeling. What is the biggest threat to your organization? Prepare for that one, just as an idea. And then we come to the format. And this is where I have seen two main formats. One of them is pretty much dry run exercise. Uh, we call it tabletop, and it's really a PowerPoint deck without technical simulation, which narrates, which tells a story of an incident and asks the people who are in the room to say, what would you do? Doesn't sound like much, right? Like, even could sound a bit boring. Well, not when it's done right. People get into the scenario, especially if you bring in some gamification and you yourself are excited about this. So this can help you identify, even only on paper, a lot of the things which are not working out, especially when it comes to the communication between teams. Uh, I'll tell you a little trick here for this type of exercise. What I usually do, because to create the exercise, you need to work with somebody from the team, from the actual organization that you are going to, um, um, to simulate targeting, so that you can create a realistic scenario. This person, the subject matter expert, is the person that I usually, after that, send on vacation. I send them sometimes to the Bahamas, I've sent them to Costa Rica, because this is usually the person who is most knowledgeable about the internal processes. This is um, Mario, whom everybody will ask if there is an incident. So this person is so key and so deep into the weeds of it that it's good to know what will happen when Mario is not there, when Mario is having digital detox in Costa Rica without any phone uh, and no connection to the internet. So, okay, this is the, the dry run, the paper exercise. Then we have the purple team. This is the other format. The purple team is super effective. Why is it purple? It, we have the two components. We have the offensive uh, team, which is attacking actually the environment. And we have the defenders, the blue ones, that are defending. Next to the defenders of the organization, it's good if you have external defenders that observe the response and can see, okay, how much time did the SOC need in order to detect? How effective were they at isolating systems, etc.? At the end, you have a very good overview of both what is your attack surface and how good are you at stopping an active attack. I think it's a great exercise. It takes, however, some preparation and time investment and budget. Let's be honest about it. This brings me to a little summary of the tips that uh, we have discussed. We have the first one, define a document hierarchy, cover the must have information, involve other teams, focus on the dynamic content, build a dream team for the development of the instant response documentation, and adopt a marathon attitude. When all of this is done, conduct regular exercises. Tip number eight is something which I have done my best and I think I managed not to drop the word throughout this documentation, uh, throughout this presentation. Make friends with the compliance team. So compliance, my best friend. Let's be honest about it, let's accept it. Incident response documentation serves two purposes. The blue purpose is what we all think about. This is what we live and breathe. This is the incident handling part. I want documents which are very clear, bullet points which give me exactly what I need during an incident as information. The reality, however, is that there exists the dark side, the orange side, the whole compliance team, which is chasing you constantly with ISO 20, uh, 27001 and God knows what other audits. 
both are needed and you're not going to avoid working with compliance teams and fulfilling compliance requirements. So better make peace with them and accept that this is simply the double row that the documents are going to have and it is okay like this. Because it is okay to have a plan which is probably imperfect but it is there, it's up to date, it's actionable, even if it's a bit lengthy, have a plan. Test it regularly and improve it because it's never going to be perfect. And with these final thoughts, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was awesome, really interesting stuff. So we do have some time still for any questions. So if you have something, please raise your hand and I will come around. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, you covered uh, on the uh, topic of which scenarios to cover in an exercise uh, with threat modeling, for example. Um, my question would be um, uh, what the uh, actual coverage needs to be in terms of scenarios for the incident response plan itself. So, for example, you have an incident where you're ac accidentally logging pass passwords and you have an incident where human error caused uh, some someone to keep the door to the d d data center open. So these are totally different and need different response plans. So what do we need to be prepared for and what can be left left out? That would be the question. So if um, I understand the question correctly, I think the question is um, when you have different scenarios, what should you prepare and where you would, you would actually place the information? And that's where this document hierarchy, as unsexy as it sounds, really comes in handy. So I would say that for a specific scenario, if it's a password like cred stolen credentials or um, let's say business email compromise, for those two scenarios, they're very different. You need two different playbooks for them. However, in your plan, it should be described, for example, the triage, like the general triage steps for both. They would be related to checking security tools. They would be related to checking logs. So this type of general steps you can have in the plan and more and as specific as you can get as steps you should have in the playbooks. Does this answer the question? Kind of. I was mm -hmm. more thinking in a direction of does every possible scenario needs to be covered in a playbook mm -hmm. or can we leave out 20% and say 80% is covered or mm -hmm. something like that? Um, what I see is that usually organizations manage to create good playbooks and keep them up to date for three to five main uh, threats. So do a thorough uh, threat modeling and this will be your um, really your guidance. I would not even attempt to create a playbook for every possible scenario. At the end of the day you have um, the people who are uh, able to adapt their, their thinking on their feet so they would be able to come up with something. And if you do the drills often enough, they would be able to pull out this playbook which is similar but not 100% applicable and use it in this case. So this is where the investment in people really uh, pays off. Cool. Still have some time for more questions. Anyone else have something? Don't be shy. Uh, how many incident response plans does a company need <laughs> <laughs> from a privacy incident response, for example, security incident response, and there might be um, operational incidents that, uh, you know, just cause downtime, but are not kind of adversary. So, and, and how do they integrate with each other? Mm -hmm. I would say you need one incident response plan, and it needs to be very clearly defined what is the scope. The scope of the incident response plan would usually be incidents which have uh, affect IT assets, uh, data, and if you have an OT environment. Um, I haven't seen, so I have seen only different instant response plans when there is a significant OT environment, and that one has its many specifics. Uh, but I would, um, I would say that if you write your plan uh, in a very structured way, you should be able to have one plan and playbooks. This is where the, the playbooks actually come into play for the different uh, scenarios. Cool. 
Any final questions? Beautiful. So, um, how do you handle people that try to fight the exercise? I take them by the ear and I drag them out of the room. <laughs> um, no, unfortunately, we don't do the tables, uh, top exercises, uh, live often enough for me to be able to do that. So I give a warning at the beginning. I call it, um, the rule of the game. So we state this explicitly. Don't fight the scenario. The scenario is imperfect, just like an incident is not perfect when you start analyzing it, who has all of the data that you would wish you had. So we make this uh, really into a very clear point and then approaching the whole thing as a training. Um, tabletop exercises should never be an assessment. If you, and, and please don't record them. I really don't think this is a good idea. Some, some organizations do it. I know who wants to watch a four hour recording after that, but it, it's very counterproductive because people don't, are, don't feel comfortable sharing their real response. They are afraid that it could be used um, against them later on. So make it a game. And uh, one of the things I do, um, it's a bit Dungeon and Dragons inspired. Um, actually, we gamify it. So you have different paths, a blue path and an orange path, the hard path and the easy path. And bringing in this whole attitude of this is training for you, enjoy it, benefit from it, it really helps. Um, also, I talk with the person. So the person that is on vacation, usually, they're still allowed to stay in the room, obviously. Um, and we discussed in the preparation meeting there is a danger that somebody in the team might decide to fight the scenario and to sabotage the exercise. We would need your help. And usually, with a few words from a manager, this works out. Great. So, last chance, final question. Anyone have one here? If not, thank you then very much once more. Uh, we have a round Thank of applause. you.